cultural in integration, which I think is what we talk about here with multicultural policies, a liberal form of civic integration and relatively inclusionary naturalization processes, and then a more assimilative, coercive integration strategy which is resistant to multiculturalism as a policy complement, uh, more coercive forms of integration, and more exclusionary naturalization processes. So that, that's a kind of conceptual frame for, that I'm going to use when I uh, turn now to, those are the tools I'm going to use to look at the European case. So, has Europe made a sudden bend? Is there a sudden bend in the path of history in Europe? That is, has Europe moved quickly or sharply from a kind of multicultural past to a civic integration future? Well, remember I mentioned that, well, those slides suggest that uh, multiculturalism policy in retreat is an overstatement because uh, because the, the countries are moving to the upper right of those sh uh, slides. Well, that's true also if you look at Europe. I apologize that you can't see the, I should have changed the color of the country names, but the country names are less important than the, the size of the boxes. So the first group are countries who strengthened their multiculturalism policies, as we have measured them here, between the year 2000 and the two, year 2010. Yeah. And the important point here is there's far more countries in that box than the other boxes. Then we have stable MCPs in France, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. Those are three countries who have not changed, who did not change their policies as we measure them. And then there are three countries, three countries, count them, three, where, that have weakened their multiculturalism policies between 2000 and 2010. Denmark, which was always very low and dropped even lower. Italy, which was also low and became a little lower. And most famously of all, the Netherlands, um, <clears throat> which is the one case where a country really did pull up multicultural policies by their roots and set them aside in favor of a different sort of pathway. And so we conclude from this chart that the retreat from multiculturalism policies in Europe has much more, more been a, a factor of discourse, of language, of a way of thinking, than it has been actual multiculturalism policies as we have defined them. Countries may not call them multicultural. They may call them intercultural. And there may be a philosophical difference in the aims that people discuss when they discuss policies. But when you look at the policies on the ground, as Oliver said, often pragmatic, often in urban settings, looks a lot like what would be happening in this country. When you look in detail at what goes on in Frankfurt and what goes on in Toronto, the, you know, the differences, the, the stark differences of the national imageries uh, are much less dramatic. Okay, so then right, we put it together <laughs> with the civic the indicator of the, of the stringency or the aggressiveness of the integration programming, is this a voluntary process? Is it supported by the government? Uh, is it something that you can choose to do or not and you're, you don't jeopardize your position in the country? Or is this a fairly assimilative strategy which requires you to move, and if you don't move, you might even not, you know, might not get your residency extended, or you might be subject to a variety of losses of social benefits, which can happen in some countries. So, what we have here, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah, and remember, the high number for this civic integration index is the tough stuff. So they, they should, you know, there should be inverse correlation, and uh, that's the situation as it exists on the ground. So the countries down to the average, right? So the countries up above <coughs> tend to have high multiculturalism policy numbers and low civic integration numbers. That is to say they're relatively liberal in their approach to integration. The kind of pressures they bring to bear on immigrants are lower. And in the bottom group, the reverse is the case. They have low multiculturalism scores. <laughs> <coughs> excuse me, and much higher inter uh, civic integration, sort of more coercive strategies. So what this tells us is one, there's a lot of variety. There's no single model in Europe. 
There are a variety of models. And, and I'm sorry it's so hard to read. If any of you are interested, I'm happy to send you these charts. For you know, At a minimum, they will help you put you to sleep at night. But I think what you can see is a couple of models emerging in Europe. Right? There is what we call multicultural integration with high MCP, uh, multiculturalism scores. That should be MCP. Um, and liberal forms of in integration. Sweden, Finland. United Kingdom is kind of ambiguous. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's a strange case in this, but I put it up here, but it, it, you might arguably put it in the lower case given its civic integration numbers. But then you have a strongly assimilative integration model with low multiculturalism policy scores and more coercive civic integration. Austria, Denmark, the Netherlands would be the polar cases of that model. And then you have your lot in the middle. Okay, so are we converging or diverging? Has, yeah, well, it depends on which group you compare, which group of European countries you are comparing Canada with. Because if you're comparing it with the, if you compare it with Sweden, we look a lot alike. Indeed, I would now call Sweden the poster child of integration. It's it of uh, multiculturalism. Uh, it was a very sobering moment for me when I was um, accused of supporting racism uh, in Stockholm. At uh, the University of Stockholm, and I was accused of supporting racism because I defended the Canadian requirement that people who were to become citizens should learn and, and at some English or French. They should learn some of the local language. And the argument I made was look, this is about citizenship, this is about participation in political life and society. You need to have some language skills to be able to do that to make citizenship meaningful. And that was considered a racist position, in, and that people were very disappointed I adopted that position, because Sweden is a country that does not require you to work, know a word of Swedish to become a Swedish citizen. Wow. Not a word. And it also, uh, on, on, the, on our chart, it, is, it ranks Sweden, it ranks seven, and that's where Canada ranks. So, you know, a lot depends on which country you're comparing yourself with when you try and decide, are we converging or not? Okay, that's Europe. Oh, we good to Dispense with Europe. <laughs> that was supposed to be the first 15 minutes, so I'm in trouble. Let me turn to Canada. I always like this uh, figure when I start to talk about Canada because, um, you know, it's a Canadian mosaic, it's a maple leaf, and it's the way we like to think about multiculturalism. Everyone's smiling. <laughs> Everyone's happy. So the Canadian model, I think I've already said this, uh, is what I've called the multiculturalism in integration strategy. We, uh, Canada ranks highly on these multiculturalism policy scores. It has an integrative conception of uh, multiculturalism. Multiculturalism is an instrument for changing the terms of integration. It's not about the preservation of cultural pluralism. 75% of Japanese Canadians are married to a non-Japanese Canadian person. If that persists, Japanese Canadians as a distinct group in Canadian life will slowly fade into the mainstream. No one says that's a policy problem. People in the community may think it's a community problem. The Jewish community has the same sort of debate internally. But there's no commitment in Canadian multiculturalism policies to preserve, to ensure that there will be a distinct Japanese-Canadian society in Canada in perpetuity. We've never made that, this has never been about the preservation of cultural segmentation. It's always been about changing the terms on which people enter the mainstream, in part by changing the mainstream itself to make it a bit more accessible. We have a liberal integration uh, model of uh, liberal model of integration, and we put enormous funds into this. I mean, the amount of money we put into multiculturalism policy is tiny, tiny. In fact, uh, Randall Hansen has a recently published paper when he said when he said when he told a French minister how little money Canada spends on multiculturalism policies per se, the minister said, "Well, that's zero. It's equivalent to zero. Whereas we spend a billion and a half, or I mean, 
uh, Gene will undoubtedly know the numbers even better than I do <clears throat> on integration policy, particularly language training, but a whole set, a suite of programs which are designed to help newcomers find their way into uh, ours, <coughs> into the system. This process, this this model was put in place. <coughs> excuse me, in the post-war era, well, in the seven, 60s and 70s. And I've always thought of it, it as the, uh, the introduction of multiculturalism in Canada was part, as, is best thought of, <coughs> excuse me, as part of a state-led attempt to redefine national identity. And when I'm trying to explain this in European context, I often use the two flags. Uh, you probably all know these two flags and know the history. But the important point here is the different nature of the flags. So the first one on the left, of course, was the Canadian flag, uh, the red ensign, which was the Canadian flag until the mid-1960s. And the really important thing about that flag is that is an ethnic flag. At a minimum, it's a European flag, right? You got your British Union Jack. You've got three symbols for parts, you know, nations within Great Britain. So you've got the uh, Welsh lyre, the English lion, and the uh, Scottish, those thistles, can't remember. And then you have the French fleur de lis. So at a minimum, this says, this is a European place. Whereas the flag on the right, I would argue is ethnically neutral. And we can debate whether or not it should be the, the, the uh, maple leaf when there are no maple, maple trees in BC. I mean, I understand. I've been there. I've had the debate. But at a minimum, on cult in cultural terms, this is a much more neutral flag than the old flag. And it was the, now the change in flags was not driven by the arrival of newcomers from other countries. It was driven by the politics of Quebec nationalism. But in that process, we established, we tried to establish an identity which was a little less British and a little more European and a little more diverse in its nature. <clears throat> now, the question I want to linger on a bit more in the Canadian context than in the European context is how much has this model changed and what are the politics of this change since the early days when it was put in place in the 70s and 80s? Um, and clearly it's different than Europe, right? It's different in Europe because there's been no big symbolic challenge. We haven't had prime ministers stand the way Chancellor Merkel stand, stood and said multiculturalism <coughs> failed utterly. So there's no big symbolic challenge, but there have been other kinds of challenges to the model, and I can't help thinking of this the way I think about the politics of change in the welfare state. So Oliver said that historically most of the work I did was on the politics of redistribution, the politics of the welfare state, and there is a lively theoretical debate about the nature of political change or nature of policy change in a system which is deeply embedded symbolically in a society. So the argument is that the welfare state is embedded and when it's embedded, it produces a particular approach to change, which people use the language of path dependency to get at. So, <clears throat> if, so the path dependency argument, I'm sure you all know, is an argument that when a society enters a new field, when a government enters a new field, it has a lot of room to make a choice. But once it's made its first big choice and put in place a policy structure, its choices quickly narrow because over time that policy structure begins to build supporters. It becomes embedded in public expectations. Interest, organized interests begin to find a way to live with it and accommodate it or support it, particularly if they're involved in the delivery of the benefits through it. So a lot of people just have argued that the welfare state has actually proven relatively durable in Western nations, in part because of path dependency, the tendency of systems to develop support, and in that context, you get a particular approach to change. You don't get the big uh, 
Uh, big symbolic attacks, if you do big symbolic attacks on a welfare state, you get rebuffed, as Margaret, Ronald Reagan, Reagan and Margaret Thatcher discovered. If it's embedded, you should expect to see reform by stealth. You should expect to see sensitive boundaries, boundary lines that are hard to change. And you should expect to see policy drift, which is to say that if you have a system which is in place and it has an internal logic, it tends to drift forward even if the problems it should be dealing with kind of over here are changing and is ignoring the new forms of, in this case, diversity that it might have embraced if those forms have been around when it was put in place. Right? So there's it, a particular dynamic, political dynamic to embedded systems. And so the question to ask is, is multiculturalism embedded in Canada in the same way that the welfare state is embedded, and therefore should we expect to see the same kind of politics? Is it embedded? Well, I think most people would argue that it's embedded at the symbolic level. Uh, Oliver's referred to the surveys which say that Canadians often say that multiculturalism is a defining feature of their country. It comes even above hockey in some surveys. Uh, never above uh, national parks and so on, but uh, pretty high up. I'm going to argue that when you look at specific policies, on the other hand, it's not as deeply embedded and not as deeply embedded as important parts of the welfare state. And for this, I'm going to present some data from a, a survey we did recently. It was uh, run in February of this year. Uh, and it was a survey actually done in the United States, Quebec, and the rest of Canada. Three separate samples. Because we wanted to be able to compare Canada, the rest of Canada, and Quebec. Because this was going on about the same time as the intense debate over the charter was going on, charter of values was going on in, in Quebec. And then we thought it healthy to compare a little bit with, uh, with, <coughs> excuse me, with the United States as a corrective to the tendency for us often to think that we're very different <coughs> than our American cousins to the south. I could talk a lot more about the survey if you want, but let me just run quickly through some of these charts. I won't linger, I'll linger over some, but I won't linger over others, and I won't linger over these. Uh, it suggests here that support for immigration is deeply embedded in these three systems. Um, <clears throat> however you measure it, uh, Quebec, the rest of Canada, and the United States are about the same in their support for levels of uh, immigration. And they are about the same in their tendency to assess the impacts of immigrations. immigration. These are standard questions used in international surveys. Does, Im does immigration increase crime rates? Is it good for the economy? Does it take jobs away? Does it improve the ideas and the culture? This, those four in this re in the way we presented this here were uh, rolled into one indicator. And that's an average mean response across those four questions, and it's virtually identical across the three samples. Now, what I wanted to do, what we wanted to do, is actually do something that had never been done before. People have asked general questions about multicultural, but they not asked about specific policies that people like us think are inherent in multiculturalism. So is the level of symbolic support higher or the same as the level of, of specific support. And it varies enormously, as we're going to see, by what you're talking about. So if you're looking at those four, first three, politics of recognition, support is relatively high <coughs> across these three systems, and it is relatively even across the three countries. I'm sorry, I should have added them for you, but the proportions that oppose, that's the easiest way to scan this <coughs> table. Just run your eyes across oppose and strongly oppose. Here we're talking about that law, in the, or the constitutional provision of the national law to say that uh, so, uh, the diversity is fundamental to your identity, ensuring schools teach about minorities and requiring the media to represent minorities. Those three, generally strong support, low levels of opposition, three systems roughly the same. If you move to accommodation, on the other hand, things are starting to get a little tighter. Did I skip over support? Hold on. No? Okay, I just have them out of order. 
allowing police and armed forces to wear religious headgear while on duty. I don't know how, if any of you here are old enough, like me, to remember the battle we had in this country over the wearing the Sikh turban with the RCMP formal dress uniform. Okay. That's a generation ago. Well, strongly opposed, the United States, 42%. The rest of Canada, 38%. Quebec, 68%. All right. Now, I'm, the 68% doesn't surprise me. Quebec was going through this issue. I'm going to come back to I'm going to put some religious uh, diversity uh, questions up in a minute. But 38% strong opposition in the rest of Canada, or, you know, what's that, 55% if you put the strong and the red just opposed in the rest of Canada on an issue we thought we'd resolved a generation ago. And so the level of support, I think, at the symbolic level is strong and deeply embedded, but when you get down to the more specific levels, it's a little tougher. Um, allowing, oh, uh, no one has any trouble with dual citizenship, at least, in, no, sorry. There's, the patterns across the countries are uh, consistent and generally dual citizenship is not a problem. Uh, this, the, qu the question's not very good. This is the uh, immigrant, this is use of immigrant languages in schools where the students don't speak the local language. Can you use their home language as a bridge language to get them into an educational context? You can see, not bad across uh, US and the rest of Canada, Quebec touches on language, much more sensitive. Multiculturalism support. Here we're talking about requiring employers to make a special effort to hire minorities. This is the Canadian number. And the, and the support levels are just a lot lower. This is employment equity, basically. The one on the right is the American version, which is uh, affirmative action, formal targets, um, and is very <coughs> mainly in the US compared to here. So, on that set, my sense is that the concept of multiculturalism, the imagery of, of a multicultural diverse society and programs which reflect that symbolically are well embedded in our country, but that the you know, uh, more specific manifestations of that, the support declines as it becomes a little more intense in its relationship to individuals. Now let's talk a little bit about religion and identity. And then I'll try and draw out some conclusions for the politics. And I apologize, Oliver, I'm out of time. So we also asked a number of questions about religion and identity. These were questions we took from international surveys in the main, and we invented some Quebec specific questions. Well, no, no, well, you'll see. Um, <clears throat> And this was prompted by our desire to understand the dynamics clearly going on in Quebec and the different kind of response that seemed to be happening in the rest of the country about the role of religion. This question is a very common question used in international surveys. How important is each of the following for truly being either American or Canadian, or whatever country is being examined? To have been born in the country. Do you have to have been born here to be truly Canadian? That's the kind of question. And you can see the responses, and um, it's, uh, it's higher than one might like, I guess, across those three countries. To have ancestry, uh, lower levels there. But the interesting one for my current purposes is to be Christian. How important is to be Christian to be a real Canadian? To be a real Canadian. Well, uh, in the United States, if you take very, take, uh, I've highlighted the very, but you have to add in the sum. U.S., clearly more important. Rest of Canada, lower. Quebec, zero. Well, virtually zero, right? And so it's not, and we're going to see that in Quebec, there's anxiety about public manifestation of uh, religion in the public space, but on the other side, it's you know, they are also not of the view you have to be Christian to be a true Canadian. And so it is as if religion should be not part of identity, uh, rather than a particular religion should be part of your identity. So, um, kind of interesting. Then we decided to ask, in effect, the charter, charter question.